Welcome, welcome, welcome. Apologize for our technical difficulties. We are so happy that you're here. We're so excited to celebrate Black Philanthropy Month this August with you and hold our second of three in a virtual series of conversations. Today's conversation is about uh, from institutional philanthropic redlining to Black freedom. My name is Michelle Merriweather, and I have the honor of serving as your host and moderator today. I am one, proudly, one of four architects of the Black Future Co-op Fund, our state's first cooperative philanthropy created by and for Black Washingtonians to ignite generational wealth, health, and well-being. I'm also proud to say that I serve as the president and CEO of the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle, which empowers African Americans and other communities of color through educational, ed economic, and employment services. Before we get started today, for our guests that would like closed captioning, auto-generated captions are available on our Facebook Live feed. Please turn them on in your settings. One of our core principles at the Black Future Co-op Fund is our commitment to being good ancestors. As we model that today, we acknowledge the land upon which we are standing is the unceded land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish people, home to the Duwamish, Suquamish, Snoqualmie, Tulayup, Muckleshoot, and Puyallup nations. We also recognize that others on this call may be on different territories, and we want to acknowledge the importance of all lands and indigenous people who are active stewards and shapers of community. In addition to that, we must recognize the vital contributions, innovations, culture, and labor with which this co country was built by the enslaved people who were brutally taken from the continent of Africa and brought here to the United States by people indigenous to this land and by other immigrants, voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, or forced. We honor with gratitude the contributions of our ancestors and lift them up in enduring spirit. All right, Black Philanthropy Month is an inclusive opportunity to illuminate the ingenuity and transformative impact of the Black generosity and encourage increased investment in Black community. Black Philanthropy Month was started by Dr. Jackie Beauvais Copeland and the Pan-African Women's Philanthropy Network in 2011 and is recognized around the world. This is our first year. Organizers in the state include the Black Future Co-op Fund, Morgan, Don Morgan Dawson and Lindsey Hill, ESK Family Fund, Renton Regional Community F Foundation, Philanthropy Northwest, and the Seattle Foundation. We have all come together to support this intentional focus for our community. We've worked with the governor's office, and Governor Inslee has also officially proclaimed August as Black Philanthropy Month in our state. As organizers of Washington's Black Philanthropy Month, our goals are to uplift the rich legacy of Black philanthropy, reclaiming what has been co-opted, and to inspire increased investment in Black communities. Shifting, shifting the philanthropic paradigm and expanding Black philanthropy's model of generosity. Philanthropy is essential to that realization and philanthropy has always been present in the Black community. Today's panel discussion is intended to explore the many ways in which Black people have given our time, talent, and treasure to the care of our community. In light of our intra-community generosity, Primarily white-led philanthropy has systemically underinvested in Black communities. Today, we will talk with Black leaders who have and continue to forge new pathways to self-determination in the face of persistent racism and racist structures. By the close of this conversation, we hope that everyone will have a reignited view of the ways in which we can create a liberated future with Black generational wealth, health, and well-being 
is the norm. Now I would like to welcome our wonderful panelists. Ruby Love is the founder of Love Resource Development Group. Among her many skills and areas of expertise, Ruby is a mobilizer of resources, business management consultant, and investor, impact strategist, and fluent in race and social equity. Ms. Ruby has also lent her expertise to more organizations and institutions and entities that can be listed here, but of note is her service to the board of directors for Social Venture Partners, as well as the February, as a February 2021 case study article she penned, Breaking the Cycle, the Truth About Philanthropy. Thank you for being here, Ms. Ruby. Thank you. Stephanie Ellis Smith is the co-founder of Guild Black, Principal Advisor and Owner of Phila Engaged Giving and Senior Advisor of the Giving Practice. Stephanie is a Charter Advisor in Philanthropy, philanthropy and a Certified 2164 Advisor in Multigenerational Philanthropy. She works with high net worth and high profile individuals and fam families, foundations, and corporations and makes a catalytic and makes to make a catalytic investment in people and organizations that advance racial and social justice. Thank you for being here, Stephanie. Valerie Curtis Newton is head of directing and playwriting of the University of Washington School of Drama and the founding artistic director of the Hansberry Project of Professional African American Theater Lab. Since 2004, Valerie has led funding efforts for the Hansberry Project and has sustained the organization to accomplish a steady stream of main stage productions, new play readings, workshops, gatherings of playwrights and, a, and financial support to other black led theater makers and organizations. She recently forged a project with Atlanta based Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater Group to develop a network of Black theaters to premiere work of Black artists across the country. That is phenomenal. And thank you for being here, Valerie Curtis Newton. My pleasure. And unfortunately, Senator Tawana Nobles isn't able to join us today. So I'll do my best to fill in for my sister architect and represent the Black Future Co-op Fund. So please welcome me in joining uh, in welcoming our incredible panelists to this virtual world, our new norm. So thank you all for being here and sharing your stories of philanthropy. So we'll start with some moderated questions and then open our questions up to the audience. And um, if you have questions for those in our viewing audience, please put them in the chat uh, throughout our conversation and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Uh, Ms. Ruby, we'll start with you. In your career as a resource developer, what have you observed as some of the most glaring examples of philanthropic redlining? Well, that's a loaded question because I can give you probably more than we have time for today. But I'd like for our audience to recall two that I anticipate you probably have heard about uh, most recently. Both of them happen to be in the, in the healthcare field. Um, the first one, and I actually wrote about it, and uh, you take note of it, and that is right here in Bellevue at the Overlake Hospital Foundation. Uh, during the height of the pandemic and the introduction of um, the vaccine, uh, the foundation took it upon themselves to send a private email to their um, highest level donors, offering them the vaccine um, outside of the, the um, essentially the what was uh, recommended by the state of Washington of who would be the first to receive. And so this is a, a glaring example of redlining and philanthropy. Why is it a glaring example? Not only because of what the foundation did, but also if you go back and you read all the articles, there's not a word from any of the board members who were actually approached, any of the major donors who were approached and who received. Um, another one that is most recent continues to be in the, and by the way, the Overlake piece is no longer in the news, which is what happens with redlining 
in philanthropy is it, it gets swept under the rug and we all forget about it. Um, one that thank goodness for Ben Danielson and others, some of you even on this call that are keeping it alive, um, the uh, situation that's going on at um, Children's Hospital and has been going on essentially since I came to Seattle and probably long before then, back in the early 1990s, um, of people essentially being denied the quality of care that they are due and that the donor community, again, at this high net worth and major donor level, not speaking up and not making it um, a priority to change the hospital's practices, their policies, and essentially how they respond to black, brown, and indigenous children. Um, and that, you know, there's, there are many others. I can tell you just my own personal, you know, experiences. Um, I've had people say, uh, is someone else coming to take care of my check? Um, we're going to give to the organization, but I was wondering, is, uh, are, are when you come back, are you going to bring someone else? Uh, I've had um, experiences, obviously, and many of us have had this where, um, you know, we are asked, are we serving the, you know, can you pour my coffee? And I'm actually the person who's going to be presenting on um, the case for supporting a particular organization that I may be working with or be on the board of. Uh, and, and I always like to point to that this is not something that's new. I like to point to my mom's experience um, way back in, I want to say 1938 or 39 at the Chicago Art Institute College where she was on the stage had received a scholarship to attend the unit, to attend the college. And when they saw her coming across the stage, they said, I'm sorry, but we called the wrong name. Now, her name was in the program. She was in fact to receive the scholarship, but it was because she was a black woman and the donor, maybe not the college, but the donor did not want it to go to a person of color. So redlining within philanthropy has happened over many, many years. And it is the responsibility of the donor as well as the investment organization that is managing the funds for the donor um, to essentially arrest what has been um, institutionalized racism in philanthropy. So much there. Thank you, uh, Ruby, that I hope that we get to take more time to get into. Um, Stephanie, in your work with high net worth individuals, what are the kinds of impacts these folks and organizations are seeking to make? And what areas of investment are they most interested in? Yeah, thank you for the question, Michelle. And um, first, I just want to thank the uh, Black Philanthropy Month organizers locally, nationally. It's so good to be here and it's so good to be uh, with Ruby and, and Valerie and you. So um, thanks for that. And then about your question, I would say, you know, after 2020, which is a year I called the, the great x-ray, which sort of showed, you know, all of our breaks and cracks and fissures in our society, people, of course, were looking to do better. Um, they're looking to diversify their giving portfolios, supporting BIPOC, particularly Black issues and causes. Everybody was moved to act and everyone wanted to have a big impact. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, my co-founders, Christina Lewis and David Sariati and I um, co-founded Give Black to help give people a channel um, for dollars and um, for their dollars and also for their energy. And just as a side note around the sort of philanthropic redlining that, that Ruby just outlined so well, one of the, another sort of red line that Give Black was specifically created to address was this idea of, well, I would give more to black organizations, but who even knows where they are, mm. you know? So we did that to say, well, there's now there's no excuse. You can look it up here. We've got 653 of them that you can select for. So that was one sort of redlining issue that we wanted to address with that. But to your questions, people wanted to have big impact after 2020, but what does that even mean? And I'll circle back to that because I wanna talk about where they wanted to have this impact. And that's the areas of their investment, the issues and causes. And from my perspective and what I heard, um, it was the big, hairy, intractable causes that we're thinking about a lot right now. Racial injustice, climate change, economic inequality. 
these are the types of issues where there's not going to be just one hero and a cape that can come in and swoop and fix these problems. Impact for these kinds of issues has to be redefined. And I think for many donors, it has to be incremental. It has to be personal. Um, so for these for these kinds of donors, the high and ultra high net wealth kind of folks who want to engage here, this is a great reset for them. It's a time for the great reset. How are we now going to think about um, impact? Um, this, these big issues are not going to be solved by them coming in and dropping just one big check. That's wonderful, but that's not going to solve the problem, nor is it them coming in being, quote unquote, the smartest person in the room. Um, these donors, their foundations and any other entities who choose to engage in an authentic and helpful way are now in a new space. Um, if they're doing it right, they are now with us, people in BIPOC communities who have been living in this space, feeling the hope, frustration, disappointment we have felt for decades trying to address and deal with these problems and these issues. And to, to do that and to sit in this space, if you are not used to it, takes humility, creativity, and doggedness to actually be useful partners in this work. I mean, if you want to be a traditional, you know, old school kind of donor, that's fine. But if, but if you want to actually get in this space and really have impact, you have to sit with these folks who are doing the work. You have to be behind them. You have to be willing to learn and you have to really be willing to engage. So to circle back to the question about the impact that they're seeking to make, frankly, again, for the folks that I see, many are at step one of impact, and that's about self-accountability. Mm. That's asking the questions, how am I approaching this work? Am I participating, I'm sorry, am I partnering or am I dictating? Realizing that maybe the best and highest use for their involvement is not maybe money or not just their money, but their network, their testimony, their ties, their voice. And just a few examples, uh, just a couple of examples. Um, yeah, please. Holly Foundation, um, who've been doing some amazing work. And then there are two private clients of mine who've completely restructured their giving um, in a way that seeds, gives over and then seeds their power. So impact, and what we mean by that, looks different in 2021 than it did in 2019. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, and that is a lot of the reason the Black Future Co-op Fund was founded, just to change and turn, we, we, we say turn philanthropy on its head, right? Okay. To change the, the giving model primarily uh, to the Black community, but to all communities and folks that are doing this heavy work and heavy lifting every day. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And Valerie, to bring you into the conversation, uh, in the ecosystem of support to artists and artistic development, which in 2020, I will be the first to say, has not been enough in 2021, uh, where have Black artists found themselves and uh, in what ways are they seeking to bust the philanthropic redlining bubble? I think that um, there's a, several things that are going on for Black artists. The first thing is Stephanie mentioned the sort of areas where ph philanthropists are interested in investing, arts and culture are very low on that list. So by the time we get everyone literate and conquer climate change and deal with the inequalities in the criminal justice system and, 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 and the healthcare system, by the time they get down to, and what about arts and culture, We've already, we're at the bottom of the list of priorities. So part of what we have to do actually is to talk about how our work actually empowers, emboldens, and strengthens all those other areas, right? There's a way that we can articulate the issues around climate change that make it a visceral thing for people. It's not just a spreadsheet of facts, but it's actually a story that they can relate to it's a way that they can see in person the impacts impacting individuals. Um, so that's the first thing is that we, we're not really prioritized with all the stuff. But another thing is that historically, our, our the arts have been patron driven, right? You have a, a, a patron, it used to be like the king or the duke who would invest in your work and then you basically had to make your work to please the king or the duke. 
So they would keep funding you. And then here in the US, we shifted that a little bit from the king and the duke to the big family foundations. So the big families um, replaced the king and the duke, but there's still this idea that we must create work that pleases them which is another constraint placed on the artists. So but before we can even get in line to get money, we've got to get in front of the family foundations or the state government foundations. We have to prove that we're as important as literacy and criminal justice to the community. And then we have to hope that the funds flow to arts and culture sector. sector. In Washington, they've been working on adjusting some of the funding models to ensure a steady stream of funds to the arts and culture section. But where global majority organizations fit in that landscape is still sort of on the fringes. We're still marginalized in the funding stream and in the funding formulas uh, as organizations so that we're undercapitalized, which makes growth almost impossible. And we're the ones who are dedicated to getting money down to individual BIPOC artists. So uh, uh, ethnically specific theaters, music, uh, uh, cultural centers are, are the most direct conduit to individual artists. Um, part of what we're trying to do to break that right now is that there has been a lot of uh, conversation since folks in New York and across the country came out with a document called We See You White America, White American Theater. And it talked about all the ways that systematic racism exists inside theater, particular arts institutions. And um, there were a lot of them that were of the things that were asked for, which were very important and fundamental. And there were many that were stretch goals and some uh, aspirational goals. Uh, organizations and institutions are wrestling with these um, requests, demands, um, and we'll see sort of in the next year how it all shakes out. They're beginning to make some progress. Um, there's lots of um, impulse towards more collaboration, more partnerships, uh, more power sharing, but it's not an easy road to get from the king or the duke to shared power. We still have to sort of tick it off uh, like the tumblers in a combination lock, you know, right 25, left 18. We're still trying to find the right combination to get into the uh -huh. vault. I was in a, a, a meeting with a bunch of Seattle theater leaders and they were talking about um, giving up their seats uh, in their organizations to make space for BIPOC individuals to lead those organizations. And I sort of shook up the meeting because I said, I don't want you to abdicate your role in your theater. I want you to give me the money mm. in there. I want the money in there to come to my theater. I want the money in there to go to CIS Productions. I want the money in there to go to a, an indigenous uh, theater company. I don't want to take over the rep. I want to build the Hansberry project to be able to make the work that's important to our community. And so it's a little bit of um, trying to phone both things, trying to find ways to partner with predominantly white institutions while we build our own capacity to make our own work and represent our own community and therefore put money right back into the pockets of our artists. So that's a pretty long winded explanation but that's the state of things in the arts. I love it though. And I thank you for that. And I, I hope that we get to a place that it's not an either or, but a both and social justice and criminal justice and all of those things. If we invest in, in, in arts and culture, I bet you for our community, we would solve some of those problems. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, for laying that foundation. Um, uh, Let's see, I think I'm going to ask uh, this question. I'm going to start with Stephanie. Um, how does the lived experience of Black leaders affect their ability to administer to the needs of the Black community? And of course, 
any of you who uh, have thoughts on that question, please chime in. But Stephanie, I'll start with you. Sure, um, I'm happy to, to kick it off. I, I think it's hugely cru uh, crucial. Um, you know, again, sort of going to the Give Black example, um, the organizations in the database uh, right now are organizations who are founded by uh, Black people. Um, and what's really beautiful about it is that we have everything in there from animals to arts to um, healthcare, education, um, hockey. Uh, there's a wonderful quote, um, uh, Valerie, you'll probably appreciate this and I'm sure you know it, but it's um, August Wilson has this quote that I love and I live by, frankly. Um, he says, uh, the using sort of black culture as a muse is as wide open as God's closet. Hmm. So there is any and everything that needs to happen that our community needs, wants, needs to be fed by. Our founders, our people are there and we know what it is. They're there in that database. These are the, the widest array of, of ideas and areas of impact that are defined by black people. And I find that to be beautiful and empowering and just really inspiring. And I think, you know, especially focusing on founders, part of it, frankly, is a capacity issue right now. We just don't have the back end to put, you know, every led organization as well. But starting at least with founders, we felt really comfortable about that because um, these are the people who identified the needs that they saw in their community, however they define that community. Um, it came from them. And so, um, so I guess that's one way that I would probably answer this question about how key and important it is that lived experience for um, social change. If I, could, if I could just chime in as well, I think one of the things that we're struggling with right now is bridging our own generation gap between leader elders and young revolutionaries, right? We've got to figure out the balance between burning it down so something new can grow and making a bridge to people who were a part of, who understand the systems because we've engaged with them over time. And as we're starting to, as we have begun to figure them out, communicating the, the tricks and traps is something that older leaders through our lived experience that we can articulate to younger leaders who have the fire to engage. And it's mm -hmm. like you, you were saying before, it's not an either or proposition. It's not um, only burn things down, it's figuring out um, what we really need and how to get to our need. That's the big question. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so I think that there is a way for us to be engaged with community, but it is about actually communication uh, across generation. We also have to deal with our internal isms inside our own community. We gotta deal mm -hmm. with our own sexism, homophobia, transphobia, religious uh, uh, issues. We have to figure out how to actually be, as John Lewis would say, the beloved community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm because we're, we're very divided amongst ourselves and that uh, impacts philanthropy as well. How we yeah. formulate a unified message that says these are our priorities. We wanna be clear that you understand our priorities. I, I was talking to my students and I said to them, you know, you don't have to trust anybody. You have to trust your ability to enforce your own boundaries. Mm -hmm. So if I articulate what I will accept, and then I'm accountable for monitoring my own boundaries, whether I trust the funder or I don't trust the funder, I trust the institution or I don't trust the institution, my cause is protected because I am protecting it. Like so that. that's one of my one of my learned experiences that it, it there's a lot going on right now about how we can't trust predominantly white institutions. And I'm like, I, I don't disagree with that. Right. But I don't think that that should stop us from engaging with them. Yeah. That we, as long as we are in a place where we're good with what our boundaries are, we're brave mm -hmm. enough to protect them. 
Uh, the other John Lewis quote that I love is this idea of getting into good trouble. Mm -hmm. And um, I was having to explain to, again, to some young people, because they're looking for safe space. And I said, you know, you can't have good safe space and get into good yeah. trouble at the same time. They're actually diametrically opposed principles. That's right. So you have to be willing to get roughed up and to defend your boundaries and to move forward. And so that's the, the message that I would love to communicate to the yeah. youth, to the to the yeah. young, young and just the, the next generation below me in leadership, mm -hmm. because I their energy to change things yeah. is so positive and so mm -hmm. uh energizing. Um, mm -hmm. But there is this other, there is another way. We need all the ways. We need to be working in all the ways. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Thank you. And I would add simply to what you're saying, Valerie, is so many of us are not willing to state our boundaries. Mm. So, you know, you, you cannot get through this in a state of fear that someone may judge you or, or speak ill of what you state as your boundaries. As we, you know, as I say, I'll use any pronoun, but you know what I would rather you do? Call Ruby Love, call her out, and and I'll be responsive. And our organizations have to do the same. Our we as as donors have to do the same. We as as uh, Valerie said, as an instructor, um, it, and we have shied away from that, expecting that we are going to have to adhere to someone else's rules someone else's values, someone else's boundaries. So I, I, I agree with you. And I think, I think that that might be where the disconnect is of our young people, right? Because they, they have set their boundaries. They have been very clear about where they, what they won't accept and what they want. Um, so how do we start building that bridge? Um, because their, their demands have been very clear of government, of philanthropy, of everything else. And, and, you know, our, our traditional organizations, again, are, are tr having those po more polite conversations, I'll say. Um, how do we get, how do we get to that? How do we, how do we build that bridge? I, I think that it is a communication. You know, like, I, I think that when I encounter young folks and their goal is safety, then we need to have a conversation. They can be really clear about the need for safety. Right. But I'm, I'm not sure that, again, that, that this is a place where there might be a division in our culture. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? I, I, right. For me, mm -hmm. change is more important than my safety. If there's another person who has a different set of priorities, we have to have a real conversation about our strategy so that we can both get some semblance of what we need. Neither one is gonna get everything we need. Right, right. But there's right. also a, there's right. also a part of compromise that mm -hmm. young people in their clarity, mm -hmm. um, compromise is a, is a betrayal, is inherently a betrayal. Yeah. There's no sense of getting what's available right now to build towards getting more in the future. I have to have it all right now or it's a failure. There's a young person at the University of Washington who said, why should I listen to the elders, the civil rights generation? They did not solve racism. So why should I listen to them? That's an indication I said, in your books. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, there's, there's, there's got to be some history that's, that's uh, understood and appreciated. And, you know, we're only, it's a long time. And yet we're, 200 years, 250 years away from slavery. Mm -hmm. In the course of the, the history of the whole country and then the history of the whole world, look at where we were in the 1950s and mm -hmm. where we are now. The, the incremental progress in those 50 years has been huge. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. to discount it as though it was nothing that's not bridge building. That doesn't allow us to have good communication. So I think that there is, there needs to be more talk and appreciation for what each of us is bringing to the table. And there is, there is a kind of wisdom that our lived experience gives us, which is not about timidity at all. There's mm -hmm. a way in which our wisdom can give us 
tools to activate, to put pressure, to cut off, to be strategic. But um, that, that wisdom is not really appreciated most of the, many times in today's environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, to add to that, I often think of my friend, truly my friend, with carries the same name, Ruby Bridges. And um, this, this child, all by herself, went into a school that was totally populated by white people, accompanied, yes, by a police officer who had no actual desire to do that, but was ordered. And so most young people do have a context in that way. Um, and, and so, yes, lived experience is very, very important. And most don't have that context and don't know actually what it is to live in an unsafe space. Yeah, and that's a wonderful um, example, Ruby. Um, and to tie that to um, something that Valerie said earlier about understanding how these issues of civil rights or criminal justice reform, or all these big issues, big things that donors are looking to solve, mm -hmm. um, are are taught and minds are changed through actually the arts. That is really when you're changing hearts and minds, culture and the arts is really the only way in my mind, I and mean, then arts and culture is my first place that I go, is, 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 how, is how we do it. And with the story about Ruby Bridges, when I uh, was uh, executive of the CD Forum, we had a youth play that went around the entire state of Washington and goes to school. And it was about Ruby Bridges, who was six years old. Six years old, the civil rights movement was done on the backs children yeah. you know and, and talk about an unsafe space and putting your life and limb and body on the line and the feedback that we got from people watching that mm -hmm. uh, in their schools was i had no idea i read about civil rights and what was you know the back of the bus and all of this stuff, but i didn't the visceral the visceral understanding and learning of what that actually entailed and what people sacrificed, that's a, the power of the arts to really drive these, these issues and these things home. And so I just wanted to tie that um, together because that's, that's what the arts are there for. And how many of us cried and felt an incredible amount of pride watching uh, Amanda Borman um, deliver the, the poem at the inauguration. And of course we could go on and on, but um, funding for the arts and, and getting sort of donors to understand sustainable change around mm -hmm. climate or um, racial injustice, economic inequality, all of these things are intertwined. We live intersectional lives and our intersectional people and our issues are intersectional. And I think when we get into trouble intergenerationally um, uh, around our giving is when we try to put human beings and people in too narrow a box. Mm -hmm. we, there, is, there is an expansive room and space for us to process and deal with all of these things. And in tactical terms, we have money as a, as a society. We have plenty of money for all of it. Yeah. yeah. I think that the, the idea that, um, that, oh, that elders are not interested in change or are, are too incrementalist in how change happens, I think that we really... Again, it wants to be both and, not either or, right? Yeah. I want to advance the ball as long as, you know, this is a, a really silly example. I learned to play golf at Jefferson Golf Course. And mm -hmm. I got ad adopted by all these old black men who play and have played for mm -hmm. years. And we went out on the, on the course and I was getting so frustrated because I couldn't hit the ball far. And Sam, who was teaching me, he said, as long as you're walking forward, hmm. you're having a good game. That's right. As long as there you hit is. the ball and you're walking <laughs> forward, you're having a there good game. There it is. And I, I think that's true about our strategic objectives as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I want to get on the green and I want to put it in the hole in as few strokes as possible. But as long as I'm walking forward, we're doing all right. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Ruby, I want to I want to start with you on this question uh, and we're going to just shift slightly uh, mm -hmm. to talk about um, how um, our allies or others can be a part of this work. So how can we work with our non-Black leaders to speed up? Yes, we want to go forward. We want to do it a little bit faster, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, how can we um, speed up the equitable distribution of philanthropic funding from our non-Black uh, leaders and, and allies? Well, I look to a number of different opportunities. One of the things I love is Donors of Color Network. So I love it because it is inclusive of donors of, of color. Now, you know, when people start talking about allies, and we usually, the image that comes to my mind is white folks. And I, I'll get to that. But what I, especially here in the Northwest, we are not a critical mass. So for me, I really have to look to other people of color and they self-identify. It's not me saying that you are, they must self-identify for us to get into a coalition, a collective at, you know, to join at tables to actually talk about how we are going to elevate our image, our, our message, our values and our boundaries of what we are going to take to the various sources of funding and to try and do that in a con in a concerted way. So I don't all, we don't always come to consensus. We don't always come to agreement, but we have to be in concert. And I say concert because I think about the arts. Sorry, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> I think about the arts and how, you know, within the music community in particular, with um, the orchestra, with the symphony, um, with the jazz group, the, it, people are playing different instruments to create a, a sound that we all want to be a part of. And I think about our giving and our moving that needle um, within supporting, getting our organization supported in that way. Um, I'm working right now with an organization front and center. It's about climate justice, but we were, you know, one of our members is the Afghan Health Initiative. And so we were contacted by them People go, but Ruby, are they are they people of color? I'm like, you know what? If they tell me that they're a body of color, people of color, then they are to me. And so, yes, I'm helping our refugees that are coming to this country. And, and so that's how it happens. We have to get on board with folks because here in the Northwest in particular, we need people of color as our allies to go forward to bring the resources to bear in our communities. Mm -hmm. And so that that's really how I do it. And um, it's how I've always done it. And we just, we've got to be more intentional about that. Organizations like that, that you represent Michelle with um, the Urban League, with the NAACP, the name NAACP, it's, it's in there. So I, don't, I don't shy away from the, the colored word all the time because it's a part of our history and that is something that was inclusive at the time and so you know i'm, I'm wandering a little bit but that that is really where i go with that mm -hmm. and going to those traditional white funders with that message that if you're going to talk to us you need to be talking to them too and um eliminate that ten thousand dollar ceiling that tends to get sent to us as this is this is what we've got for you and, um, you know, I have clients that I talk with and I say, we're going to go forward and our ask is going to be multi-year and we're going forward and we're going to ask for between 300 to half a million dollars. They're like in one sitting. Yes. In one sitting, because that's what it's going to take for us to move anything forward as that we talked about in the work that we are trying to accomplish that tends to not resonate initially with our organizations because we haven't operated in those spaces. But it is a space that we have to step into with confidence, with intention, and in concert. I, I just one of the things that that um, that arts theater organizations, small theater organizations, one of the things that we struggle with actually is donor development. Mm. Not not necessarily foundations, but uh, major donors uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. So 
we're trying to actually learn to think about a $50,000, $100,000 ask, which is not something many of us do on the regular. We're like, let me just get my next project up. I need $4,000. And we act like that's the most money in the world and like no one's going to give it to us. And we just have to get better at asking and continuing to ask, even if people say no. Um, that's that's a really important thing for us. I think with regard to allyship, Michelle, the, the most important thing are folks and organizations who are really going to meet us where we are and, uh, and listen to us. Stephanie talked about this earlier, this idea of listening with a kind of humility. Um, and then putting their resources, support, energy uh, in service of our best interests. So yeah. I, I love the idea that when someone who's an ally for my theater is in a room with funders or with other organizations and there are no global majority folks in there, that yeah. that ally is going to say that. Mm -hmm. It's going to invoke the idea that we can't actually talk about racial equity because we don't have any global majority people right. in this room. Right. And I'm not going to come back until we do to have this conversation. Right. We need them to be as clear about their boundaries as they can be as well. And mm -hmm. so I think that's actually the mark of an ally is someone who's willing to put them, put their own interests on the line in support of our goals because a recognition that our goals actually lift all the boats get folks to lean into that and that that's a determinant of who is an ally and who is a well-wisher but allies but, do things they don't just think things allies do things yes i call that person a co-conspirator they're in that room to make sure that we're in there too like yeah. they're part of the plan mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. part of the plan as well. Uh, Stephanie, you have anything to add to that, uh, to this uh, question? Um, how just, can our non-Black? Yeah, just very briefly, I would just say, you know, looking at how to get this equitable distribution of philanthropic funding, that particular piece, um, I, you know, again, I would just sort of reiterate this idea of, of, of looking at true cost, like how much, yeah. not, you know, this one little piece thing, but how much, how much, do you need to actually do the work? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a part of, and I think it's an illuminating exercise for nonprofit leaders to yeah. really put together like, gosh, okay, all of this stuff, my break time, the time that I need to just step away and refresh my mind, that's all work mm -hmm. to do, put together the real numbers. And that's also, I think, about um, the ownership piece of, of what we're actually doing when we're doing that work on the front lines. And that is what it costs. And I think that helps with um, that redistribution of funding because um, that puts the ball back in the funder's court of saying, are you going to actually fund this? Because I gave you the, like, if you want to step into this place of racial equity, you know, um, arts, justice, climate justice this is what it takes to play with us yeah full stop mm -hmm. and the ball is in their court mm -hmm. i love that i love that and and can i also just add that it needs to be a continuous conversation not just when something happens yeah, yeah. you yeah. know yeah. like so you know, like every day every day every day, <laughs> every well, day. And I, I think that that, I, that idea that it's every day and that it's ongoing also mm -hmm. requires that folks have a 360 degree view of the impact of their resources, yes. right? That it needs to go into the hands of global majority folks, not pass through anybody. In the eighties, there was a whole bunch of money that was set up to go through white organizations to get to our communities. Yeah. They called mm -hmm. it outreach. And what it mm -hmm. did was, what it did was it killed all the, many of the groups of, that were ethnically specific in a range mm -hmm. of fields, not mm -hmm. just the arts. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it's like, if you had a black theater, there was no money for you because the big mm -hmm. white theater in town got extra to serve yeah. your audience. And they yeah. asked for your mailing list. 
And they exactly. after your meal ended. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and never and never yeah. gave you theirs. They nope. never gave you theirs. Oh, no. they, they, they didn't never want you that. asking their white donors for money. So yeah. it's like, I want you to tell me where the black dollars are, but don't ask me where the white dollars are. That funders and donors have to be mindful of the mm -hmm. streams into which they put the funds and the clarity of those streams as it relates to the impact they want to have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? That's a shift right there, especially, you know, you may give us the introduction to those donors. We can take it from there. Give us, right. tell us where the, where to go. Mm -hmm. Don't just ask us for our list. I love that. And, and I want to add to that what you just said, Valerie. So in terms, I like to give people a visual. So where did we see this happening? So you, most people on the call are probably familiar with the word empowerment zone. So if your black organization didn't fall within the empowerment zone, then you couldn't you couldn't even ask for the money. And, the, and this has happened, you know, over and over again. So, um, yeah, we're, we are corralled. And then if you don't fit in that corral, then you're not a part of the opportunity. And um, those are ways of essentially keeping us out, whether it's the arts or social justice or climate justice or uh, any other type of organization. Absolutely. And I think there's also the the other side that that of all of this, which is what you all are working on, is that black folks have money. Mm -hmm. Black mm -hmm. folks have money. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. not just it's not just white folks who can solve or begin to have impacts in these areas. Mm -hmm. Yes, we want an equitable share of the money that some of them have. Because, and this was one of the theater examples. I was in a, a, a panel, we were talking about um, our access to funds for theater. And everyone was talking about how we generate and manage to create our own wealth. And one of the playwrights said, but if that big theater is getting a grant from the state, that's your money in there too. That's right. If that big theater is getting a right. grant from the county, that's your money in there too. So yes, raise and collect and tap your community to be self-sufficient, but go in there and get what you need from these predominantly white organizations. If I need a different process for getting the art that's meaningful to my community on the stage, I have to go into those buildings and tell them, you've got some of my money in here that's and right. I want it to be reflected in the product that you're putting out. So it's it, it again, it's over and over this idea of both, both that we have funds in, in the theater, they developed the Black Seed Fund, which was like seven million dollars multi year funding to give mm -hmm. to organizations with some development for managing the money. Because sometimes, you know, we, we start on our own without real education about how to manage the money in, a, in an institution. And so they did that. And yet still there's money in these white organizations that actually comes from us already. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And just a reminder to our viewing audience, if you have questions after my next question, we'll open it up to the audience uh, and take questions from you. So put them in the chat and our team will grab them and uh, share them with us. Um, I think I'll, I'll uh, start with you, Valerie, on this question. How do we uh, how do we strike that balance between the for us by us mentality of self sufficiency and one of partnership with more established institutions? I start with you because this is this is your reality. So help yeah, me. I think uh, for us by us about us near us. I believe all in that all of that. And I also hear Malcolm X every day by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. So if there's, if there's a goal that I want to achieve, a vision that I want to move forward, I have to look at every possible means. And some of that is self-sufficient. Like um, when I started the Hansbury Project, we were located at ACT Theater. They asked if I would curate some shows for them. I said, no, I said, I will partner with you 
in a way that gives me some autonomous authority mm -hmm. to make work in your space for a black community or people interested in the work of black artists. So that was a partnership, but I was very clear about my vision and I set my own boundaries. Mm -hmm. I think that that's an important thing for us is to have our own um, clarity about what our vision is and then to actually uh, test and adjudicate every strategy that's possible. Every experiment you can make, try the experiment. If it's never been done before, move that one up higher on the list. Yeah. Try those things first, the scariest thing first. It's got to be this uh, by, any, by any means necessary mentality. If we want to survive and actually thrive, I think there's no, uh, no strategy that should be off the table. Mm -hmm. Ruby, your thoughts on uh, striking that balance? Well, I think one of the things that I know is very much out of balance is where we, where we have dollars, where black folks have the dollars, where are we investing them? Mm. And when I'm saying where are we investing them, I don't just mean giving them away. I mean, who is acting on our behalf as our investment manager of funds? So this is a craw, a craw, whatever you call it, a knit in my saddle, and that is we keep looking to the white investment houses to handle our funds. There are people right here that will do that for us with great success. And if you want to go beyond Seattle, there's folks just out, you know, they're outside of the Seattle marketplace. And we need to let white folks know also you have there are people of color who are investment managers who are very adept at investing our dollars, advising us on where our dollars can go and grow. And so, you know, that's one of the, I think that's one of the big things for me. So, you know, I call on Greg, Glenn Gregory at Obsidian. I call on Bronze Investments. Um, you know, I call on um, donors, the Donors of Color Network. And so that is, I think that's a leveling of um, opportunity that we are not taking advantage of. And many of our organizations have no clue that that's um, something that they need to essentially um, look into. The same way with, you know, who are, who's handling your accounting? Uh, all of those things. Who are the contractors, consultants, and vendors that we are placing our dollars with? And it, it can be different. It has to be different. It has to be different. It has to be different. And Stephanie, um, how, your thoughts on striking that balance? Yeah, I, I would just say I think established institutions that are that truly believe in our work to advance racial justice, um, equity overall, they will understand. I think the importance of self determination in mm -hmm. our work. Um, it can't be done without a full boom mentality because we, as far as talking about philanthropy in particular, um, that work is more than just shifting philanthropy. It stems from generations of stolen wealth an opportunity um, that has created the situation that we're in now. So we have mm -hmm. to, this is what Ruby said, this we have to be very conscious about not just where we donate our dollars, but where we spend our dollars. Yeah. Um, every, you know, you know, people want to are really excited about impact investing and everybody, whether they want to or think it or not, they're all impact investing right now. You were putting your money where you your beliefs are. Um, if you believe in ease and what and you know I don't know whatever and and you're just kind of just dropping your money here and not thinking about it, you're having an impact. Mm -hmm. is, the question is: Is this the impact that you actually want to have? Um, and I think when we put our our money, charitable or otherwise, um, in black-owned or BIPOC spaces, um, we are all all of us, whether you're white, black, indigenous, whomever. Are, are making a choice to actually help un upend generations of, of, you know, lost opportunity. And I think for this for us bias mentality, just speaking particularly for black people, maybe just speaking for myself, I feel we must have control and autonomy and pride uh, in society. And it's, it's important. 
um, and I think it's absolutely necessary. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Ruby, uh, Sonia, and, uh, for watching from YouTube said, can you speak uh, more to the idea of someone else's boundaries that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, so what I'm saying is, is that um, traditionally in philanthropy, it has been the philanthropist or the donor that has set the agenda, that essentially puts up the guardrails, puts up the, the um, boundaries. And we see this happening where we have funders who say we're going to have, a, you know, we'll have a meet the funders. I don't want to meet the funders. I want y'all to meet me. There we go. Meet our organization. Um, and so we, we instead, you know, what I do is I work with organizations and we host meetings where we invite funders to come and they get to listen to us. Yeah. They get to hear what our agenda is, what our values are, what our boundaries are. And we also get to say, no, we don't, we don't want your money. And so this is very different. This is very different. So that's what I mean about those boundaries. And what that means is it moves you out of a, um, a deficit thinking about who you are as an organization, as a people, as a fundraiser, as a board of directors. And it moves you into, we have assets that are of value to the community because they're of value to us. Mm -hmm. And we're going to share with you how you can get um, engaged with our assets. Yes. And, and I, I will say, um, and, and I, I welcome anybody to add uh, to, to, the, to the comments, but that was the, that was the catalyst for the Black Teacher Co-op Fund. We are operating from Black abundance, no longer in deficit, deficit mindset. Yes, we have a lot to solve for, but look at how resourceful and resilient and beautiful we are and what we are able to accomplish um, ourselves, right? And so, yes, I, and, and we have set this table and we invite uh, funders to be a part of of our solutions, our community rooted solutions, and the folks that are doing amazing, amazing work um, mm -hmm. that many people don't even see. Mm -hmm. right. another, another piece I might just add real quick is yes. we traditionally are used to writing big reports about what we've done, the impact, right. the data, the this, the that, all of that sort of thing. Again, this is another one that gets turned on its head. I. I want to know, because the corporations and foundations and individual donors actually tout our story. Mm -hmm. This is my story yes. in order to essentially attract the next organization to come and ask them for money. Yes. I want to know instead, I want that story is mine. And so how you represent it, I need to be the editor of what you put on your website about us. Yes. Now that is that is like really foreign to folks, but this is it's our story. We we they march our children across the stage to raise money. They put you know uh, tears running down people's faces to raise money. You all, that is that is racism. I don't know how it, times two thousand. Yeah. Um, it's institutionalized, and why it it's institutionalized and redlined in philanthropy is. We actually, it, you know, institutional racism means you can't actually point to any one person or when any one offender, it's like all of them. And so that's how it's so difficult to get your arms around. And it's also how the majority population is able to deny that it even exists. That's why, you know, this is going into another area, but it's also why I don't talk about critical race theory, because it's not a theory. It, it is. It is. Do you want to call it a theory? That's your thing. But it is not a theory for the yeah. four of us on this call. It is real. It's actual. It's fact. We've lived it. It is. And so it's, it's the same way about how we express our generosity and our philanthropy is um, let's turn it all around, turn it all upside down. And everybody on this call is doing that. But those of you who are listening, think about how it's going to manifest itself in your life, in your organization. Um, Stephanie, I'm going to start with you on this question um, from our listening or viewing audience, Annette. Um, 
Are funding and philanthropy limited to only nonprofit organizations? What about small black owned businesses that do not want to be government dependent? I think that's such a, a great question. Um, you know, I, I call, you know, giving, and I kind of alluded to this a little bit before about where you put your money. It's a uh, values-based giving and whether you're giving to a C3, uh, an individual, a company um, where you're buying your daily uh, needs, um, that's all value-based. Um, I'll say, and I know um, Annette, this may be, I mean, philanthropy is my space, so forgive me if I sort of still stay a little bit over there, but I, I just wanna say, and hopefully this can help um, answer your question, when I work with my clients and my donors and they're looking at the issues where they wanna be involved, the things that they care most about, yeah, there's going to be some tax issues. That's a big reason, Annette, that a lot of people are kind of focusing on the charitable sector is because if there's some tax consequences, if people need tax breaks or want tax breaks, the C3 helps with that. But with a lot of folks, and when they don't really care or if they come under the, um, the threshold for getting a tax deduction, it's all values-based giving. And when I talk to my clients, I say, okay, your issue is, you know, economic justice. Well, how can you address economic justice if you don't support black businesses? Mm -hmm. This is beyond tax. This is about the issue. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we try to look across, you know, sector and, and be kind of um, tax status agnostic to the extent that we can, because if people are, are giving based on their values and what kind of world that they want to see, um, you can't just be relegated to only C3s. And I would say for the businesses who are trying to attract values-based investors, you just need, need to make sure that we can see it, that I can, that we can, that I could point people to that this is a company or this is a, a small business that actually stands for something beyond, of course, you know, making your money and doing well. But like, what, what's your, what's your value? What is, what do you care about? Um, I think people who are looking to um, put their money in those places, they're looking to see that. And so if it's not um, obvious, uh, try to make that a little bit more obvious. I think that would be helpful. And then the last example that I would say, and um, I'm glad you brought it up, Ruby, it's about where you put your money. Um, this is, you know, philanthropy, capitalism, in my mind, it's kind of all the same thing. I mean, we wouldn't have philanthropy without capitalism. So we can't be all high and mighty that we're not capital. Of course we are. That's the, whole, that's the whole reason why these dollars are here and what we're doing. But that said, we can do our philanthropy better. And we could use our philanthropic dollars and all of our assets in ways that um, that push change faster. And that's outside of, of the C3 sector. And you know, the idea of hiring um, Black wealth managers, financial advisors, is huge. And just a short little example of this, uh, one of my clients is, is actually, has actually done that. Uh, he and his wife left their uh, longtime financial advisor who happened to actually be a friend. Um, they were together for 25 plus years. But the way that this couple wanted to really have a different kind of impact and a bigger impact, not just with their charitable dollars, but with all the rest of the assets that are sitting over there, um, they moved from their longtime advisor to a Black-owned firm, Grid 202, that's based in uh, D.C. and Charlotte. And with one fell swoop, and this is something that allies uh, can do, with one fell swoop, this uh, couple increased the assets under management of this Black-owned firm by five times. See? And all of their, this firm works mostly exclusively with black families. So now I'm getting chills thinking about it. 75, 75 to 100, however many clients that they had, predominantly black, at least 85%, now have assets, uh, access to higher level of uh, managers. Mm -hmm. They get a different level of service because the firm is now bumped up. And that's the type of impact when people want to talk about impact. And like, what can philanthropy do? Philanthropy can do a lot of good things, but all that other money that people have that's sitting over here, that's where the action is. Oh, yeah, I love that. I, I, I'll just chime in on 
to follow up on Stephanie's point, I think the value space giving is really important. And it's so it's really strategic for us to learn how to talk about return on investment through a values based mm -hmm. lens. So yeah. what do you get for your money? Again, because we're operating in a capitalist environment, it could be that you get you know, the, the, the satisfaction of doing something positive. It could be your name on a street or on a street or over a door or, you know, or uh, children getting t-shirts with your name on the back. Like there can be different ways of thinking about your return on investment that everybody mm -hmm. must have. And the other thing mm -hmm. is the Hansberry Project actually is not strictly a 501c3 organization. We have a fiscal sponsor that sponsors all of our nonprofit activity. If we wanted to do a for-profit endeavor, we're allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. But people who donate to it are investors and not donors. There's a difference between those two things. And right. so, you know, figuring out how to generate as much donated um, revenue as we can while we also still generate strategies for earned income, all of that is uh, is part of the, playing the game and uh, yeah. and working with people who can help you have access to more money, even if you're a business. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Valerie, the last question goes to you from our audience. Jan from YouTube wants to know, what are some helpful strategies for arts organizations who generally want to attract Black, Indigenous, and people of color audiences and are using traditional outreach strategies to more effectively engage? Um, I think we go back to communication, that, that um, communities need to feel seen. And however they define that, you've got to meet them where they are. If that means that you've got to take things to them, that's one thing. Um, if it means that you need to bring them to your space, that's another thing. There are different strategies of, of, that are about hmm, finding out what people are interested in, what their um, issues are, having a two-way communication, mm -hmm. um, getting feedback from them and then making adjustments, and then putting out more reflections of the community through your arts. Um, but the idea that you're not connected to what's going on in your community, that's a way to make shows where no one ever shows up. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's the most effective way of communicating with that community? You know, in the 21st century, radio's not so much it, but it used to be that the black <laughs> radio station is where you wanted to put your ad because mm -hmm. that's where they would find it. They would find that's it right. in the medium and not in the in the times. They would find it mm -hmm. in the stranger and not in the PI, right? So you have to learn. Now we're doing Facebook and all kinds of digital marketing. And even that, we're um, not access being accessible to everyone as we move more into a digital space. Um, it's getting better, but there's still a, gap, a technology gap in our community. So being aware of that and trying to solve for it is important. Um, but yeah, it's a give and take with the community and identifying ambassadors, inviting them to participate in conversations about what will be mm -hmm. on your stage. All of that is good and useful. They're good and useful strategies. But the thing we get wrong most often is we just make it and say people have to take it and they mm -hmm. don't. Because why? Because we are in a capitalist society. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have to take it. If they don't like it, they won't come. Well, we have to end on that note. And I'm so grateful to all of you for your wisdom, your leadership, your expertise, uh, all of that. And I can I can spend another hour on this, this conversation with the three brilliant minds here, um, at least hours. Um, but we have to end it there. So thank you so much, Miss Ruby, Stephanie, and Valerie for uh, your time and your insight. And I invite our audience to join us next week, next Tuesday, August 31st at 5 p.m. Uh, for our topic, Where is the Money? A virtual e event on accountability for corporations and foundations who pledged, remember that pledge and those tweets and <laughs> social media to support Black communities last year to our 
during our global social uprising. And so we invite you to join us there and, and encourage you to uh, stay engaged. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.